The True Worship 8. The Lord's Supper. By J. S. Blackburn. Chapter 8. The Lord's Supper. Perhaps the one subject of agreement by Christian writers of all points of view on worship is that the Lord's Supper is the center for true Christian worship. What is much more important is that this statement is strictly true to Scripture, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16 It cannot be doubted that the worship of individuals is acceptable to God. The worship of Abraham and in many psalms exemplifies this. Whenever a Christian's heart, moved by thoughts of the loveliness of Christ, rises to the Father in responsive love and gratitude, there is true worship. Nevertheless, the centering of the Old Testament worship on the tabernacle and the temple, as well as the essential plurality of the holy priesthood in 1 Peter 2 verse 5, lead to the conclusion that the full intention of God is seen in collective rather than individual worship. The expression the cup of blessing is often misunderstood being taken to mean blessing from God coming down to his people. This meaning is often linked by contrast with the Savior's cup of sorrow when he said the cup which my Father has given me, shall I not drink it, and when in Gethsemane he prayed, with sweat as great drops of blood falling down to the ground, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not as I will, but as thou wilt. It is indeed true, and will never be forgotten, that his people have received the blessing because he bore the sorrow, but this is not the meaning of the expression, the cup of blessing. Here we are to understand blessing rising to God from his people. That this is the meaning is clear from two considerations. First, the explanatory phrase which follows, which we bless, shows that the Spirit of God intends blessing by the worshippers, and not blessing to them. Second, the cup of blessing which we bless is evidently intended as a parallel with the Jews' cup of blessing, and this unquestionably refers to blessing rising to God. The Passover service as celebrated in the Apostles' time included a cup of blessing, so named because in taking this cup they uttered the words, Blessed art thou, Jehovah our God. Over the cup of blessing which we bless arise blessing and worship to the Father and the Son. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 3. Thou art worthy, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, Revelation 5 verse 9. The breaking of bread is twice considered in 1 Corinthians, in 10 colon 16 17 and 21 under the title The Lord's Table, and again in 11 verses 20 to 34 under the title The Lord's Supper. The latter passage forms a unity with the following chapters extending from 11 17 to 14 verse 40, and this section is very important for our subject since it describes the kind of gathering in which the Lord's Supper is partaken, and therefore the kind of gathering which is the setting for the true worship. The section comprising 1 Corinthians 11 verse 17 to 14 verse 40 is shown to be a unity principally by the recurring phrase, in, the de church or, in assembly. We begin at 11 verse 18, when ye are come together in assembly, and pass to the same phrase in 14 verse 19, in assembly I had rather speak five words with my understanding, in 14 verse 28, let him keep silence in assembly, and in 14 verse 35, it is a shame for a woman to speak in assembly. Also the word speaking, very frequent in chapter 14, is there an expansion on the same word in 12 verse 3, no man speaking by the Spirit of God, calls Jesus accursed, and in 13 verse 1, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. The frequent repetition of these two phrases suggests the title for the whole section, speaking in assembly. Principally from 14 verses 15 and 16 we know what were the activities appropriate to meeting in assembly. They were prophecy, tongues, prayer, singing, blessing, giving thanks, teaching, revelation, interpretation. It would surely be quite wrong to conclude that, because prophecy for edification is shown to be superior to tongues, the gathering described is for edification. The activities mentioned seem rather to indicate that the New Testament gathering generally, for many purposes, was of this kind, and that the Lord's Supper was one of the principal purposes for which such gatherings were held. In such gatherings for the purpose of the Lord's Supper, blessing, giving thanks and singing would doubtless be prominent, though others of the list might have a place. It is very interesting to note the tests by which all that takes place in assembly is to be judged. In chapter 14 these tests are employed to compare prophecy with tongues, to the detriment of tongues. In verses 3 to 5 the test is, does it edify? In verses 6 to 12 the question to be answered is, is it clear in meaning? 
and in verses 13 to 20, is the understanding of the speaker satisfyingly involved? Above all, in chapter 13 the test is, have I love? The characteristics of such a gathering, the setting for the Lord's Supper, and therefore for collective worship, are assembled in verses 26 to 40. Every man may contribute in any of the activities named, according to what the Spirit gives. Everything must be judged by the tests described. Women are commanded to be silent. Everything must be decent and orderly, for example, two persons are not to speak at once, and a speaker must not lose control of himself in a trance. Such is the framework established by the Spirit of God for His activities in the church, for eating and drinking the Lord's Supper, for blessing and exalting the Lord Jesus, and for the worship of the Father. It is idle to maintain that Scripture leaves this matter open. The matter could not well be given more explicitly or in greater detail. 1 Corinthians 14 is a dead letter to so many Christians because it conflicts with the deeply ingrained habits of Christendom, not because its meaning is obscure. It remains to notice how closely these features are connected with what has previously been said about worship as a system of priesthood and sacrifice. For this divinely formed company, for whose gatherings these chapters are the commandments of the Lord, is the spiritual house of which Peter speaks, the holy priesthood ordained to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper is to call to mind the one great sacrifice of Calvary, by this remembrance there are formed in the minds and hearts of the participants those thoughts of the love of Christ shown in death for the glory of God and His people's salvation which becomes substance for spiritual sacrifices. Just as, following that sacrifice, the Lord Jesus says in resurrection, In the midst of the church will I sing praise to thee, so the saints in assembly, guided, directed and empowered by the Spirit, pass from the contemplation of Christ in death to the realization of His resurrection, and so to the worship of the Father and the Son. On the morning of the resurrection, with an urgency which would brook no delay, the Lord sent to the assembled disciples the message, My Father and your Father. My God and your God, John 20 verse 17. Immediately following his death he moves to engage his disciples with the Father, so in like manner the remembrance of his death leads to the worship of the Father. We have already seen how this is pictured in Revelation 5. The vision of the Lamb as it had been slain leads the dwellers in heaven to give blessing and worship to him that sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. 